Asian nations. U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai says Washington is committed to work with ASEAN in areas such as trade, facilitation and labor to help build back pandemic hit supply chains and make them more resilient, inclusive and sustainable moving forward. She also looks forward to increased trading between the U.S. and ASEAN members. U.S. goods and services trade with ASEAN totaled nearly $442 billion last year. That is a 22 percent increase compared to the year before. Backing the president's pitch, Aboites Group President and CEO Sabine Aboites. The convener of the president's private sector advisory council also addressed investors at the NYSE, calling the Philippines the next big thing in Asia. The friendship between our two countries has always been Wall Street itself, a busy two way street of economic give and take. And we sincerely hope and believe it will remain like this forever. We live in uncertain times, but in our corner of the world, the Philippines remains one of Asia's fastest growing economies. And with the pandemic now largely out of the way, we're back on the fast track, accelerating out of recovery mode and onto the promising possibilities of the future. Now more than ever, with the dawn of a new era of digital progress and an environment that has never been more enabling and conducive for business, the Philippines is ripe for investment. The Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. receives a warm welcome on Wall Street as he makes a pitch before global investors to do business here in the country. ABS-CBN's Pia Gutierrez is in New York. She filed this report. President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. on Tuesday noted the importance of strengthening bilateral relations between the Philippines and the United States amid ongoing geopolitical and economic uncertainties. The president made a statement as he addressed global investors, traders and Philippine business leaders in an afternoon forum at the New York Stock Exchange where he was invited as guest and in a chat with the New York Stock Exchange Vice Chairman John Tuttle, Marcos says he intends to further deepen bilateral ties with the U.S. during his term, noting that he cannot overstate the economic and political ties between both countries. I cannot see the Philippines in the future without having the, the, having the United States as a partner. Many of the drivers of our early economy were actually American corporations. Um, many of the uh, strongest uh, uh, corporate uh, benefactors, really, to government and to the rest of society in the Philippines were coming from the United States. They provide the stability in this highly unstable economic, political, geopolitical, diplomatic environment. This is something that, uh, that is central to um, our thinking you know, when it comes to the economic, the economic planning for the Philippines. Marcos Jr., meanwhile, in his speech, presented the Philippines as a viable investment destination to potential American investors, noting that the country continues to bounce back from the pandemic, with the Philippine economy seeing robust growth since last year. To international investors, the Philippines offers high-quality labor, a large consumer market, and a wide range of fiscal and non-fiscal incentives. At the same time, we remain committed to maintaining sound macroeconomic fundamentals, providing a clear development roadmap. For American businesses, we offer investment opportunities in areas such as information technology and business process management, or IT BPM, medical products and devices, electric vehicles and batteries, agribusiness and telecommunications infrastructure and services. 
The president says his administration is committed to support economic recovery through sound macroeconomic policies as well as commitment to fiscal discipline, which he says will also help the Philippines become a middle-income country during his term. After the forum, the president, assisted by Tuttle, rang the ceremonial bell at the New York Stock Exchange trading floor, signaling the end of trading for the day. Other business engagements line up for the six-day state visit of the president are dialogues with the U.S. ASEAN Business Council and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, as well as the Philippine Economic Briefing happening. On A fast-growing economy with an educated and ambitious workforce and meaningful economic reforms are coming together to make the Philippines an attractive destination for investment. And I have to say, looking at today's room, clearly you have gained the attention of business leaders and investors. We at the NYSC enjoy hosting programs like this where we can bring together leaders from the public sector and private sector to share ideas to build relationships and ultimately deliver impact. And with today's program, I am confident that we will further strengthen an already great partnership between our markets, between our businesses, between our people, and ultimately between our countries. To begin our program, I have the pleasure of introducing Sabin Aboites, who is CEO of Aboites Group and importantly, leader of President Marcos's Private Sector Advisory Council. Please join me in offering him a very warm welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. As a representative of the Philippine business and behalf of the delegation here today, I want to thank all of you for the invitation to visit the financial center of the universe and touch base with our friends in the American business community. Your warm welcome is strongly felt and greatly appreciated. Personally, I'm really thrilled to be here. The New York Stock Exchange has energy like nowhere else in the world. The only natural and appropriate response to this invitation would be to return the favor in the best way that we know how. And with the same spirit of goodwill and partnership, the United States has shown the Philippines for all these many decades. The friendship between our two countries has always been like Wall Street itself, a busy two-way street of economic give and take. And we sincerely hope and believe it will remain like this forever. So we're here today to support our president and his genuine efforts to revitalize this relationship and remind you of our commitment. We support his efforts to assure you of the integrity, of the stability, and the solidarity of his administration and the Philippine economic system, which is not without wounds, but neither without the determination to heal them and of course to unlock the massive economic potential our country has to offer with the help of good friends like you. We live in uncertain times, but in our corner of the world, the Philippines remains one of Asia's fastest growing economies. And with the pandemic now largely out of the way, we're back on the fast track, accelerating out of recovery mode and onto the promising possibilities of the future. Now more than ever, with the dawn of a new era of digital progress and an environment that has never been more enabling and conducive for business, the Philippines is ripe for investment. With the average Filipino being 23 years old, we have a large talent, a large talent pool of young, competent, and reliable human resources. Our workforce is educated, English proficient, strongly customer-oriented, highly trainable, and adaptable to different cultures. Being a critical entry point for over 600 million people in the ASEAN region, the Philippines has easy access to key markets, which is a gateway to the East Asian economies, and is at the crossroads of international shipping lanes and airline routes. 
Our numerous operating economic zones and IT parks around the country are fully equipped with support capabilities that make it easy for companies of any size and from any part of the world to set up shop and conduct business, business with convenience and effectivity. We have a bountiful and beautiful natural resources that provide investment opportunities in our agriculture and tourism industries. Our business process outsourcing, electronics, manufacturing, creative, maritime resources, and export industries have similar potential with track records of success. And with a strong private-public partnership, we are aggressively building the critical infrastructure needed to support all our industries and enable businesses to grow and thrive on a globally competitive scale. But most importantly, we have a strong leader with a compelling vision and the political will to realize it. With a uniform, unified support of our Congress and the Filipino people, the new Marcos administration is taking a whole of government and nation approach to deliver on its promise to transform our economy. We in the business community believe in this vision. And as our longtime allies and partners, we hope you will too. I've seen many presidents in my lifetime and they all have their strengths. The one we have today has quite cleverly gotten 30 of our country's busiest CEOs to voluntarily work for him. I know this because I'm one of them. And as convener of the Private Secretary Advisory Council to the President, I have witnessed the ability of this man to bring together the best minds in business, use them to find real solutions to real problems, and then immediately implement them like he was flipping a switch. This is why we work for him, because he listens to reason and gets things done, because he has the humility to seek the help of those who know more in order to provide help to those who need more. This is the kind of decisive, action-oriented leadership we have today. This is the kind of leadership that inspires a nation to believe in its true worth. And this is the kind of inclusive and collaborative leadership that will transform our economy into the next big thing in Asia. I thank you and good afternoon. And on that note, I'd like to introduce the Secretary of Finance, Secretary Jokno, to introduce the President. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce to you the President of the Republic of the Philippines, President Ferdinand Romualdez Marcos, Jr. Please be seated. Uh, thank you, uh, Secretary Ben Jokno, uh, all the members of the cabinet of the Philippines, Mr. John Tuttle, the Vice Chairman of the New York Stock Exchange, and uh, for those kind words from Mr. Sabine Aboites, the convener of the Private Sector Advisory Council. Uh, we have also with us the Speaker of the House, House Speaker Ferdinand Martin Romualdez, and the, our ambassador to uh, the United States, Ambassador Jose Manuel Romualdez. Also with us is our permanent uh, ambassador to the UN, uh, Ambassador Antonio Lagdameo Sr. And I would be uh, remiss if it, I did not, of course, include uh, in my greetings the First Lady uh, Lisa Araneta Marcos. Distinguished guests uh, here today, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. 
On behalf of the Philippine delegation, I wish to express our gratitude to the New York Stock Exchange for inviting us here today. I consider it an engagement of invaluable opportunity to share with you how we are further opening up our economy to accelerate our recovery. Bouncing back from the pandemic, the Philippine economy has seen robust growth since last year and has returned to its path toward upper middle income country status, achievable, we believe, within the next few years. Against this backdrop, we have increased the scope for mutually beneficial investments that would mean more jobs and a better quality of life for Filipinos. For investors, doing business in the Philippines is an opportunity to reap the benefits of a vibrant economy. We are proud to share that we recently enacted policies to further liberalize our economy and welcome more foreign investment to our shores. First, we passed legislation to lower corporate income tax rates and rationalize fiscal incentives. Second, we reduced the minimum paid up capital requirements for foreign retailers and foreign startup, startups, bringing in advanced new technology. And third, we now allow full foreign ownership of companies providing public services such as telecommunications, shipping, air carriers, railways, subways, airports, and toll roads. The United States and the Philippines have strong and enduring ties in trade and commerce, among many other areas of cooperation. The U.S. is our third largest trading partner and second major source of foreign direct investment applications in 2021. To international investors, the Philippines offers high quality labor, a large consumer market, and a wide range of fiscal and non-fiscal incentives. At the same time, we remain committed to maintaining sound macroeconomic fundamentals, providing a clear development roadmap. Let me expound a little bit on these important points. First, sound macroeconomic fundamentals. Our gross domestic product is projected to grow by 6.5 to 7.5% this year, by 6.5 to 8% from 2023 to 2028. The employment situation has improved following the temporary disruption caused by the pandemic. The un unemployment spike of 17.6% in April 2020 fell drastically to 5.2% in July this year, the lowest record for all July rounds of our labor force survey since 2005. Manufacturing activity has accelerated, staying above the growth threshold of 50 for the past seven consecutive months and settling at 51.2 last August. Trade is back to double digit growth with demand for trade partners boosting our exports and with domestically situated firms importing more inputs in anticipation of rising demand. At the same time, with our commitment to fiscal discipline, the country's debt to GDP ratio has improved to 62.1% as of end June this year from 63.5% in the previous year. At the height of the COVID-19 crisis, the government implemented massive stimulus programs to readily support the most vulnerable sectors. Although our borrowings increased substantially during the pandemic, we continue to reduce the cost of our public debt through judicious debt management. Now that the economy is reverting to normalcy, the government is likewise heading back to the path of fiscal consolidation. We will reduce the government debt to GDP ratio to below 60% by 2025 and further down to 51.2% by the end of my term in 2028. Our economy's resilience to crises is recognized internationally. The Philippines has maintained its investment grade credit ratings throughout the pandemic amid the wave of rating downgrades globally. As we look forward to achieving upper middle income status, we are also gearing up 
for A territory credit ratings in the medium term. On the external front, we have sufficient buffers against external shocks. Supported by steady inflows of overseas Filipino remittances, receipts from business processing, outsourcing, and foreign direct investment, our gross international reserves stood at $99 billion as of end August, equivalent to 8.3 months of import cover. This remains more than sufficient to cover the, econo the economy's foreign exchange needs. Moving on to my second point, our economic development roadmap. In the near term, our top priorities are protecting the purchasing power of families by managing inflation, reducing the scarring effects of the pandemic, and ensuring sound macroeconomic fundamentals. Thus, we are implementing policies that enhance food security, transport, reduce energy costs, and logistical costs. Strengthen social protection and enhance the quality of education and skills training of our workers. As we pursue our short-term agenda, we build the foundations for a stronger, more inclusive future. Our medium-term agenda includes reducing the poverty rate to single digits by 2028 and undergoing an industrial transformation through which science, technology, and innovation and sustainability will drive our industries. In all our endeavors, the private sector must be a partner. We seek partnerships in many areas of our development agenda, in public infrastructure, such as mass transit systems, airports, toll roads, in public services, in digitalization initiatives, in the energy development agenda, in efforts to modernize agriculture, and in programs aimed at strengthening our industries, to just name a few. For American businesses, we offer investment opportunities in areas such as information technology and business process management, or IT BPM, medical products and devices, electric vehicles and batteries, agribusiness and telecommunications infrastructure and services. Despite external headwinds, the Philippines' economy's resilience, reinforced by sound policies and decisive leadership, makes us confident about our future. Over the past few decades, as the Philippines transformed into one of the most promising emerging markets, the United States has been among our steady partners. For that, we are truly grateful. At the same time, American companies doing business in the Philippines have benefited significantly In a refugee camp in Pakistan's Sindh province, hungry men, women and children stand in line for food. Run by a private NGO, the site has been set up to help those affected by the recent devastating floods. Across the country, extreme flooding has displaced hundreds of thousands of people, and officials warn it could take up to six months for waters to recede. But already, the stagnant waters are having a vast impact, causing serious health issues and widespread hunger. Some 85 families live in this camp, including Samar Badal and his children. We get food once a day. I have six children. Are we going to eat this food or give it to the kids? We are facing great difficulties about food here. We just got this rice now. We will not get anything tonight. The next meal will be tomorrow at this time. Others repeat the same complaint. NGO workers say they are trying their best, but the number of flood refugees is becoming too hard to manage, especially in the worst affected Sindh province. Although many other camps and makeshift health facilities have been set up, Pakistan's already weak health system has been under immense pressure since June. The floods were caused by a historic monsoon, which dumped about three times as much rain on Pakistan as the three-decade average. Combined with glacial melt, it caused unprecedented flooding. The death toll currently stands at just over 1,500 people. The deluge has affected nearly 33 million people in the South Asian nation of 220 million, sweeping away homes, crops, bridges, roads and livestock in damages estimated at $30 billion.
Thank you, uh, Secretary Ben Jokno, uh, all the members of the cabinet of the Philippines, Mr. John Tuttle, the vice chairman of the New York Stock Exchange, and uh, for those kind words from Mr. Sabine Aboites, the convener of the Private Sector Advisory Council. Uh, we have also with us the Speaker of the House. Live mula sa GMA Network Center, ito ang 24 oras. Magandang gabi po, Luzon, Visayas at Mindanao. Gustong muling buksan ni Pangulog Bongbong Marcos ang kaso kaugnay sa sinisingil na estate tax sa Pamilya Marcos na noong 1991 ay nagkakahalaga ng mahigit 23 bilyong piso. Ayon sa Pangulo, hindi raw sila nagkaroon ng pagkakataong sumagot sa kaso. Kaya dapat daw itong buksan uli para ma-resolve na. Ito ay kahit taong 1999 pa, naging final and executory ang desisyon ng Korte Suprema. Nakatutok si Mariz Umali. Sa pong malaking karangalan na makasama natin ngayon. Nais nice ni Pangulong Bongbong Marcos na muling buksan ang kaso kaugnay sa sinisingil na estate tax sa pamilya Marcos. Sinabi ng Pangulo sa panayam ng aktres at TV host na si Tony Gonzaga. Open the case and let us argue it. So that all of the things that we should have been able to say in 1987, 88, 89, that we were not able to say. What did you want to say in 86, 87, 88, 89? Isa-isahin namin talaga yung sinasabi nilang property. Kasi hindi maliwanag ang, ang, ang pag-aari ng mga property na sinasabi. Na, sinasabi. Hello, Ramay. Hello, Tanya. Memorandum. Amin. Siya sabi namin hindi amin yan. Huwag niyo kami tinatax dyan. Sabi ng Pangulo, hindi raw sila nagkaroon ng pagkakataong sumagot sa kasong ito. Hindi raw sila nakapagpresenta ng argumento dahil nasa Amerika raw sila nang lumabas ang kaso. Kaya dapat daw buksan muli ang kaso para tuluyan na itong maresolba. Well, we, we are actually encouraging that um, this uh, finally be resolved. Because I don't want to make a legal, a legal uh, opinion for which I am not qualified. Uh, but rather to say that in, in our, we were never allowed to argue because when this case came out, we were all in the United States. So when it was the time for us to answer, we had no chance to answer because we were nakakulong in Hikam Air Force Base in Hawaii. Ilang beses na rin daw siyang pumirma ng quit claim para patunayang wala silang kinalaman sa mga ari-ari ang iyon. Paano ba sila nag-come up ng 203 billion Hindi ko na figure? Kapansa pinagsama-sama lang nila kung ano-anong property. Mm -hmm. eh, yung karamihan doon, hindi talaga wala kaming kinalaman doon. Mm -hmm. In fact, pumirma na ako, ilang beses na ako pumirma.